This past June, over a million handmade bones were laid on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. to bring attention to ongoing genocide and conflicts happening in Sudan, South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Burma, Syria, and Somalia. As an artist and a visual learner, I'm constantly constructing images in my mind of the information I consume. And many times those images have stayed with me and moved me to do something with that information. The vision for One Million Bones to be laid on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. came out of reading Philip Gorovich's book on the Rwandan genocide. We wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. It was one of the most gut-wrenching, haunting books I've ever read. And it was reading his descriptions of what happened in Rwanda, all the while knowing there was a genocide happening in Sudan and a conflict that had been going on in Congo for years that made me want to bring the image I had made of his words into my part of the world to make it real for me and for others living in the U.S. This project is a social arts practice in which we used education, hands-on art making, and produced public installations. And we did that to raise awareness about these conflicts. And what a social arts practice is, is, is it's the experience of participating that's considered a part of the artwork. And I've grown to appreciate it so much because I've seen that experience be transformational. And unlike any other medium I've worked in, I find it to be the most complex and malleable canvas with which to work on. One of the advantages of combining art and education was that we were able to introduce this really difficult topic. And this approach allowed for people of all ages to connect and learn more without having them turn away paralyzed from information they feel both disconnected to and overwhelmed by. And the action of creating a bone after learning about these conflicts was so important, and we saw how it could be the first step of bringing an activist into the movement. It's a powerful experience to create a bone and to consider the depth of that symbol. I've made hundreds of bones in this work, but the one that's most meaningful to me is this one that I made with a woman named Ashta in mind. She's my exact age and lives in Chad with her family. And when I made this pelvis, and every time I hold it, I'm reminded of so many things. I think about life and birth and beauty and the fragility of all of that. And I also think about death and the thin line between the two. I think of the four children who Ashta lost on her journey from Sudan into Chad and in the refugee camp where she lives. I think of her five other children who are still alive and how her pelvis holds all of that. These bones were meant to carry those stories, to attest to the gravity of these crises on individual lives, but they are most significant as a symbol of our human connection and a reminder that we belong to each other, which is such an important message because when we accept the idea that we belong to each other, we recognize our responsibility to one another. And that's what I regard most in this work we do. Experiencing art's capacity to bring issues, no matter how close or far away they are from us, home. And whether home is a place, a family, a freedom, or an idea, it's what we value more than anything else. And it's what we value that we fight to protect. Over the course of the project, we produced two smaller 50,000 bone preview installations in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and New Orleans, Louisiana. And I'm going to show you a video from one of those. In 1996, that's when I lost my father. And then in 1998, I lost my brother and my two nephews, and then uh, my friends. Uh, neighbors, pastors, uh, you know, all those pe I knew all those people who, who, who got killed that same night.
about the bones that are inside of us, the living bones, the pieces of our body, and how we're not so different, we're all similar. The thing that I have is not about uh, um, uh, revenge, it's not about that. So if we have to think of revenge, then this is not a solution. All we need is forgiveness and uh, thinking of the future. Like, what do we need as a Congolese? So our kids, our younger brother, our brothers, the new generation, will not go through what we've been through. I mean, you really don't know something until you know something. Then that's what a one million bones is doing, to let people know what is going on in Congo, in Sudan, in Birma, in the other countries. Keep uh, talking about it, like the message is, if the message can keep going, so people can do something about it. One of the most significant moments for me in this project came from an exchange I had that day with one of our presenters, Kigabu Mbatimatima. He's a refugee from Congo and a survivor of the Gatumba massacre in Burundi. And about an hour after we had started laying the bones down, he turned around on the road and he said to me he had to go back to his room. And so I offered to drive him. And he said, no, that's okay, I'm just going to walk. And so I offered to walk with him and he said, no, that's okay. I just have to go back to my room and I need to cry for a little while. It's just so hard. And it was a really awkward moment. We had never laid the bones down before. We didn't know how people were going to respond. Most importantly, those who it was meant to serve. And so I first said I was sorry. I would never want to make this harder. And I asked him if there was anything he thought was wrong or offensive in any way. And he said, no, that's not it. But you have to understand, we lost so many people. And we never saw what happened to those people. And in your mind, you want to believe that they were OK, that something else happened. But I saw them today. And it's so hard. But we have to face it. Everyone has to face it. And that same month we laid those bones in Albuquerque, three new mass graves were found in Sudan. When I went to New Orleans to work on the project, I didn't know much about that city. And what I learned while being there is that it's one of the most violent cities in the country. So when we brought this project into classrooms and community centers, a lot of the discussions drew from the students' personal experience. And these were incredibly honest and personal discussions. And as the students learned about the violence happening on the scale it was in Sudan and Congo, they felt this deep connection and empathy. They crafted their bones from their own stories, yet to honor the stories of those living far away. And I was blown away by how many showed up on a Saturday on their own when we laid the 50,000 down. New Orleans was a major port in the US during the African slave trade. And at the time, enslaved Africans living in the city would get one day a week to themselves. And on that day, they would come to Congo Square, where they would drum and dance. And the story is that you could hear that sound reverberate throughout the entire city. So when we laid the bones in Congo Square, it was to the sound of drumming. The leader of the drum circle, Baba Luther, has been working with his partner, Jamilia, for 30 years to keep this sacred space recognized and cradled. We asked Jamilia to lay the first bone that day. It took her three attempts, as that short journey to carry the bone brought her back both to the history of her ancestors, which she's fought so hard to keep present in her community's mind, and to her brothers and sisters in Congo. Baba Luther said in all his 30 years working in that space that he had never seen anything so powerful, and that he'd be bringing his drums to DC the next year. So when I went to Washington, D.C., one of my uh, favorite stories, um, I went to a school. They had had all their fifth and sixth graders make bones, over 1,000 students, and I went to address the students. And before I went on the stage, the teacher pulled me inside and said, just so you know, there's a student in the class who was so affected by the lesson, he was so moved by it that he started a fundraiser and raised over $1,000 for Somalian families through a UNICEF campaign. So I gave him a shout out from the stage. And when I went home that night, I like 
I researched to see if I could find that page, and I did, and it actually turns out he raised $3,500. And there was even a couple press articles published in the newspaper, and in the article it said that he had come home from school one day, and his mom said he was really bummed out. And she approached the teacher and she said, you know, I'm not sure if this lesson is appropriate for students his age. And the teacher said, well, I think it is appropriate, but why don't we connect with Liam and see if he can come up with an idea to process his feelings. And that's when he came up with this idea that he was going to run laps and swim laps. Um, and, and that's what he did. And there's a picture here. Um, you'll see, he got all his family and friends to um, support him. This is, they made a movie and this is him running his laps. But I love this story, one, because he brought the issue back to his parents. His entire family and some of their friends came to the National Mall when we laid the bones down. And I also love this story because I have no doubt that as Liam gets older, as he's confronted with more issues that concern him, He's always going to remember when he was 11 years old and he could affect change on that level and he could inspire other people to care about issues that he cared about. And those are the experiences that define character. I think the teacher had all the students write me thank you cards because I got a slew of them in the mail, but one was really special to me written by a young man named Oscar in the fifth grade. He said, thank you for taking the time to come to Washington Middle School to talk about the Million Bones Project. I really like the video that you showed us. I connected with that because once everyone in, this world is, everyone in this world is gone, our bones will still be here. And no one but God will know who is who just by looking at our bones. With a million of them laid out, they were beautiful. Each one was something, but together they were remarkable. And isn't that the story of all of us living in this world together? We carried a lot of broken bones that day. And when I started this project, I always accounted for the fact that bones were going to break. And I was okay with that, because I thought, well, that's how you would come across a mass grave with broken bones. But as they started coming in and I could see how much care and intention was put into them, I started to become uncomfortable with the idea of them breaking. And then one day I had a conversation with a man named Alan Sinaki. He's a monk who's been working in Burma for decades. And I asked him what he thought of bones, and he said, well, I think they're very sacred things. And he pointed to a box on his desk, and he said, in that box are the bones of one of my dearest friends. And I said, well, I think they're really sacred too. I said, and so I have to ask, how would you feel if you made something symbolic of its being so sacred and it were to break on its way to the mall? And he said, oh, I wouldn't worry about that. He said, everything in this world is broken. A bone by itself is something already broken. You couldn't doubt, you couldn't question that we lived in a broken world when you looked out that day and you understood that our children were called to build symbolic mass graves to remind us of a promise we made of never again, which we repeatedly have failed to deliver on. That was the most amazing thing about it. Our children did that. You can't imagine how many people told us we were crazy, that this was impossible, that nobody was going to do it. Educators would never do it, have their students make bones to address genocide. And yet over 150,000 people participated. And each one of them has their own story of that experience. One of my greatest takeaways from this project is actually a very simple truth that I think a lot of us in activism and in general tend to overlook. And that's that some people need to see things differently. They need to hear things differently. And they need to feel things differently to understand them. We can shout information out as loud as possible. We can spread it on the web as wide as we can. And perhaps a lot of people will hear it and see it. But it doesn't mean that they understood it or they could draw an emotional connection. For years, I was asked, why do you do this work? Why bones? And there's always a handful of answers I would give as to why I, we thought it was important. But the one answer I was never brave enough to say at the fear of sounding ridiculous, was that maybe, just maybe, 
It would take us carrying human bones to help remind us that we belong to each other. Because what we carry, what we hold in our two hands, that we're responsible for. And I hope that I never forget the weight of that responsibility. This is a picture of John Dow. He's a lost boy of Sudan. He was one of our speakers at the event. We had asked him to lay the first bone that day. It was a three-day event. Saturday, we laid the bones. Sunday, we had educational workshops and a vigil. And on Monday, we had an advocacy day with our partners, the Enough Project, where we had 100 meetings scheduled with our senators and congressmen. And John Dow was going to be a part of that. And then we got a call from him that morning. And he told us he had just got word that his brother was killed in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan by a bomb dropped by the Sudanese government. It was the most unforgiving moment of the project. Literally, we were on our knees. And I remember calling my colleague at the Enough Project, because they were facilitating a training for that day, and I said, if people haven't left yet, if there's anybody still there, make sure you tell them his story. Make sure they tell his story, because now it's personal to all of us. It happened a few times on the mall when I was talking to people who I'd never met before but had been working on the project. And they'd say, you know, this project changed my life. And at first, I didn't understand that, how this project could have such an impact. But what I came to realize as we walked off the mall, after John Dow's brother died in Sudan while we were laying bones in DC, after I met hundreds of people who had galvanized their communities, their cities, and their states to work on the project and then flew to DC to be a part of it there. After thousands of people stopped to see and ask what these bones were doing there, in the sheer impossibility of it all was the reality that it was these relationships that changed our lives. The relationships we built with each other, the relationships we built around these conflicts, and the relationships we built with ourselves working on it. I think one of the greatest challenges of working at the intersection of art and activism is that neither field will embrace what we do entirely. And yet both fields are striving to elicit this kind of deep down in your gut response. I'm not advocating that art or social arts practice is the solution to all of our issues. But I do recognize that a lot of our movements need more activists and that we need as many things as possible to inspire a new generation and to reawaken and stir an older one. And that's something I've seen an artistic vision do, inspire people to imagine and dream that a different reality is possible. Because without that hope, it never is. Thank you so much.